Hi everyone, sorry for presenting remotely, but my name is Priyanka Sarana and I'm a senior bioinformatician in the Tree of Life program at Sanger Institute. Today I'm going to talk about how we're doing the production of not just our assemblies, but also the publications for those assemblies. So we are part of this bigger project called the Earth Biogenome Project. Uh, it includes lots of regional as well as, uh, you know, taxon specific projects la, and we're personally involved with the vertebrate genomes project, the European reference genome atlas, the aquatic symbiosis uh, genomics, but our main key project is the Darwin tree of life. Darwin tree of life uh, is aiming to sequence more than 70 animals, fungi, protist in Britain and Ireland. Why we're bothering to do it? Mostly because we want to help with conservation efforts or, and also because we believe that the research into these new organisms will help provide uh, new biomolecules and new tools for biotechnology. And overall, we're really interested in understanding the evolution of life. And all the work that we do, we try to follow open science and fair principles by releasing all our data immediately without embargo on public databases. So even before we get to the assembly, our raw data is available as soon as we finish the assembly. Uh, our assemblies are available even before the publications are ready. So yes, everyone can use it and benefit from it. So this is our genome engine. So 70,000 of them and through this engine on a weekly basis, lots of uh, more than 60 of them are going through it. So obviously it starts with sample acquisition, which is done by our partners across uh, the islands. And then it, we collect the metadata, the also the DNA extraction, RNA extraction is done in the sequencing. Once the lab part is done, I'll talk more about the informatics, which I actually know about. So then the first thing we do is obviously quality check and Shane is in charge of it. So directly from the sequencing machines, once we get the data, it runs through a series of checks and all the results from that check is put on a portal, the tree of life QC. So toll QC is what it's called and you can access it. It's publicly available. Uh, then we move on to genome assembly. So currently we're in the process of moving all our pipelines to Nextflow. Some of them are already there. Some are, uh, we're working on it. So genome assembly is one of those that's in development. This is when the long pack bio data and the short high C data are combined to create the best assemblies uh, computationally. And Sinia is working on this uh, pipeline. So then we have the curation step, which is very involved. It starts with checking for contamination or cobines, depending on the project. Then we have a pipeline that called Trival, which goes through a whole series of steps, checking for syntony, telomeres. Uh, it creates these contact maps. And all of this data that's created by these first two pipelines is used by human curators to actually look at the data and figure out, you know, if there are breaks, disjoints, and they move it all around and get it in the perfect possible shape. Once they're done with it, they run this short pipeline called curation pretext, and all these three pipelines are currently in development. So they run the curation pretext after which all the data is uploaded to ENA. Uh, and there is an automated system to do that on a regular basis. Uh, we have a tie in with Ensemble Rapid Release where they do the annotation for us for all our genomes. And everything then gets put onto the Darwin Tree of Life portal for other of our projects. We're working on the portal as well, but the, the Darwin Tree of Life one is already live. But the main thing I want to talk to you today about is creating these applications. So we are working on 
70,000 genomes. So the way it works out is about 60 per week. So imagine writing 60 different publications every week. It would be nightmarish. We don't want to do it. So which is why we've created a series of Nextflow pipelines and a web application uh, to do this. A little bit more detail on why we are really interested in it is first, it's the scalability factor that I talked about, but it also means we reduce the time to publication. For smaller genomes, we could do it within a day. Uh, for larger genomes, it might take a few days going from a released assembly to a publication. But in general, it's a lot shorter time than a human doing the work. It also reduces the cost of publication for us because through the traditional submission methods, we directly submit an XML file and the images to F1000 uh, internally. And most importantly, it'll, we're hoping it will reduce the time it takes to go through peer review. Um, paper the reviewers have to go through all of it in detail you know comment and go through the cycle of review what we are doing is because over 90 percent of our text is standardized and the matrix and uh the vgp published a series of assembly quality matrix that they consider a standard for the earth biogenome project and using those we can kind of rate our publication as to, okay, we are meeting the standards or we are not meeting the standards. And that would help the peer reviewers to quickly go uh, and just speed up the process. So how are we doing it? We're creating this web application, which can be deployed on commercial clouds, but also on the native systems. Uh, and this is going to be for everyone. It's not just for us. So using this anyone anywhere in the world can <coughs> submit their data to be converted into a genome note, uh, which is the automated publications. Uh, the only criteria we have is that all the data and all the genome sequences should be available through INSDC. It could be private, but it should be available through INSDC. Finally, the portal will also run all of the pipelines associated uh, with going from the release all the way to publication. It will create the images and it will validate the results based on them. So what are these pipelines that I keep talking about? So we call them the genome after party. They are a series of eight pipelines uh, and they're all built with Nextflow and NF Core and they because we work on such a large scale, they're designed for diversity. So as long as you work on the EU carryout, we have at some point touched something close to that. And again, because of the scale and the speed we want to work at, we are constantly improving these for efficiency. And we spend a lot of time documenting it. So hopefully other people can very easily use them. So I'll talk about some of these pipelines right now. So first we have the download pipelines. They're very simple pipelines, but they're very powerful pipelines. So what they do is they, you, they download the first one, the INSDC download. Sorry. The first one, the INSDC download, it downloads the FASTA file, the genome FASTA file from NCBI. It, un, it creates an unmasked copy as well and then calculates a bunch of indices for them. The ensemble gene download, as the name says, downloads different uh, transcript files. So the transcriptome, the CDS, the cDNA, those FASTA files, as well as the GFF file, and then calculates the indices for that. The repeat download gets the ENA, uh, repeat the information and in both the FASTA format uh, and then it calculates like creates a bed file as well as the indices. The reason they're powerful is because the way we've got it set up is they check every day whether any new uh, data is available and download it. 
The reason there are three separate pipelines is because the data doesn't get released at the same time for the same genome uh, in all these three categories. So keeping it separate just keeps things clean for us. Then all of our raw data, uh, along with the genome is used to align, to do the alignment. And that for that, we use the read mapping pipeline. So the high C and Illumina are our short tree data. And we use a very standardized best practice kind of a uh, workflow for these. So we convert it into the right format. We align it with BWMM. Then we do mark duplicate and calculate a series of statistics for them. For ONT, we use Minimap for aligning and calculate the statistics for PacBio. We still have some older PacBio data and we have data. So we have a filtering step to, uh, for that. And then we align with Minimap and do the calculate the statistics. In the future, we'll also be adding ultra low high fidelity PacBio or more commonly known as the ULI PacBio. And we're working with some partners to kind of have more inputs and outputs. For all our pipeline development, we kind of work with the different partners and you know our users to kind of get input as to how they're using it and constantly keep improving it. So every few months we'll have like a release or something like that. Next is our variant calling pipeline. And this one is right now mostly focused on pack bio data with deep variant. In the future, we will add Illumina data with free base and some structural variant calling. But the pack bio deep variant was our like you know first use case, and that's what this pipeline does right now. Then we have the blob toolkit. So this is a very key pipeline in terms of it identifies non-host DNA. It also statistics based on coverage. It creates two key uh, images for our genome node. The first one here uh, on the left is, you can see the two blobs. There's this big blue blob and there are these little tiny colorful small blobs on the side. What this image is showing is there is some contamination. So the blue blob is the, the actual data we want for the Atlantic host mackerel. And these little ones are probably contaminants. This image is pre like, you know, pre curation. So afterwards, this data was cleaned up and the final uh, only had the nice blue blob in the uh, publication. So, and the second image, which is also included in the genome node, uh, is a snail diagram. What it is showing is the the size of the different genomes of the different chromosomes, uh, as well as on top, you can see it shows the BUSCO results, uh, and Based on the BUSCO, which uh, indicates the completeness of the genome, it's about 98% complete. So pretty good. Uh, then we have our last pipeline, which kind of pulls all of this information together and creates the actual publication, the genome node pipeline. It creates the contact maps. The contact maps are high C maps. So they are aligned against the genome and they show how the different chromosomes are arranged. So each of those little squares is a chromosome. And at the bottom where you see lots of small little dots, those ones are scaffolds that couldn't be assembled into a chromosome. This uh, pipeline also calculates a bunch of statistics and puts it all together in the final genome node. So we publish everything on F1000, and if you go to the Welcome Open Research page, there is a specific dedicated portal for uh, Darwin Tree of Life. And this is what, on the right, you can see what one of our publications looks like. As you can see, this has gone through three peer reviews. It's all very transparent, very open, and anyone can look at it. If we update something, the version number gets updated as well. 
all of the information on our pipelines as well as our genome notes can be found on our website. Um, so, and we love to hear from you if you have any feedback for us. And also for features, if you want to use it and you need like one feature added or something, we're happy to work with you. But all of this work couldn't be done without a very large team. For uh, informatics teams, the assembly team, the curation team, uh, platform teams, which helps us with APIs and web apps, and my team, the infrastructure team, uh, the Blob Toolkit project, the conversion uh, from SnakeMake to NextFlow was started during Google Summer of Code by Alex. Uh, and later on, we had a rotating student, Zainab, who joined in the effort. And everything is done with NextFlow and NF course. So we want to thank those communities because they help us a lot on Slack while we're building it. And we get our funding from Welcome uh, through the sign and also some from the UKRI. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions online? Yes. OK. Um. Priyanka, I don't know if you can see the questions in the Q&A. Uh, there's one there for you uh, from Chris Fields. Um, which tools like DeepVariant, uh, which by default uses models trained on human data, um, how do you restrain the models for your specific genome assembly? Um, so we've tested it. So for pack, so we've made some uh, like we, we have we've made some modification in in terms of the arguments for the deep variant results for more than 30 different genomes in various different taxa and the heterozygosity that we calculate after running deep variant and also the heterozygosity that we get initially match so we're pretty sure that the results the, we don't have a true variant data set uh, but we're pretty sure the, the the variant calls are good based on that heterozygosity um, data set. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other question? Uh, okay. Hello. Uh, yes, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I would like to, uh, to ask you about uh, the annotation pipeline that you use. So usually we need transcriptomics or proteomics data, especially for plant or animal genomes, um, in order to do genome annotation. Uh, so how could you do that de novo without collecting this data? Uh, so, uh, like I mentioned, we don't actually do it in-house. So Ensemble uh, does that for us. They do the annotation for country of life. Uh, we do not have, I know for a fact, we do not have transcriptomic data for all of our genomes. So even for the ones we don't have, they do run de novo on it. I'm, I can, if I, if, you, if I have your information, I can connect you to the ensemble teams. And uh, yeah, if you just post your information on chat, I can connect you to the ensemble teams and get you more information on that. <laughs> 